All right. Well, to keep with time, I will get started and we'll let everybody join as, as they get here. Um, so welcome everybody to today's knowledge sharing event on school food financing and fundraising. Um, my name is Sarah Keyes and I'm the pro provincial lead for the Ontario chapter of the Coalition for Healthy School Food. And this, that's administered by Sustain Ontario. Um, I'm going to be facilitating our conversation today and I want to thank you all for coming. So um, to start... Um, I, I wanted to start our event by thinking about how food connects us to the land and the water. Um, so this is a photo of my front yard garden from last year, um, which was a home to an ecosystem of, of many happy creatures, creatures that live both below the soil and above. Um, I used to love watching the bees and the butterf butterflies as they buzzed around and helped my food and my, my uh, our flowers grow, um, and then finding worms and insects in the soil as, as we gardened. Um, I also really loved sinking my hands into the soil and feeling the calm and grounding that came with it and seeing how nourishing, uh, you know, uh, taking care of the plants and watering them and the whole process was was to my kids. Um, the space did used to put a really big smile on a lot of my neighbors faces as they walked by and, and even food into some of their pockets. It was a place of connection and joy, and so I wanted to share it with you all to start our conversation today. Um, I'm now located on the traditional and unceded territory of uh, the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples, um, and I'm really, I'm new, we're new here, and we're really grateful to be living and working here, and excited to build these kinds of relationships and connections uh, to the land and the life that it holds, and the people who take care of it and are who who are supported by it in return. Um, I do encourage you, everybody here today, to take a moment to reflect on your relationship with the land and that you're on across Turtle Island, um, as well as its caretakers, your community, and the steps that you're taking towards reconciliation. So moving into our updates, um, uh, first, we, we do have a full agenda. Um, so we're going to start, I'm going to start by sharing some provincial and national uh, school food updates. Um, then I'm going to turn it over to uh, our presenters who, gonna, who are going to share about uh, Sorry, one second. Uh, they're going to share uh, their experience in terms of school food financing and fundraising. Um, we're going to hear about how some municipalities are involved in school food uh, financing. And then we're going to hear about some campaigns, strategies and models that hopefully will be useful in your own region. Um, we're going to wrap up today's event by uh, doing a discussion and a Q&A. And I will ask everybody to save their questions till the end of everybody's presentation so that we can have that big discussion at the, at the end. So if you have a question while uh, pre presenters are, are presenting, you can either put it in the chat or just save it in your mind and we'll, we'll get to that point at the end. Um, we are also going to be recording the first part of this webinar and sharing it out afterwards, but we'll stop recording before the discussion and Q&A starts. So to get into our, our updates. So for those of you who are new to us, the Ontario, uh, the Ontario chapter of the Coalition for Healthy School Food is made up of over 85 members and endorsers. Uh, we have school food providers, nonprofits, cities, school boards, indigenous organizations, public health and provincial education organizations. And so we've been meeting as a chapter since 2021 to help school food supporters connect, learn about each other, other's work, share best practices and explore opportunities to make sure school food programs are robust and well supported both within the province and within Canada. And we, of course, are part of the National Coalition, um, which is Canada's largest school food network. We have now over 425 members and endorsers from across the country who are working together to advance school food in Canada. Um, our vision is that eventually all students in Canada will have access to nourishing food at school every day. Uh, we take a nonpartisan approach nonpartisan approach to our work and we collaborate with community-based practitioners, experts and leaders to work towards our goals, one of which is uh, advocating for a national cost-shared school food program for Canada. As many of you probably know, we're the only G7 country without a national program, so we've been working hard to change that. And this is our federal pre-budget submission for this year, um, which is asking the Liberal government, who has have committed to develop a, both a program and a policy for Canada in their 2021 election platform. They promised $1 billion over five years. So our 2024 pre-budget submission is asking them to honour that commitment and start funding school food in this next federal budget to the tune of $200 million starting in budget 2024, and then for five years, at least after that. Um, we have also asked the government to negotiate agreements with Indigenous leaders for independent and distinction-based First Nation, Métis, and Inuit programs, 
as well as dedicate $50 million towards the school food infrastructure fund. So that's our federal pre-budget ask. And then here in Ontario, this is our Ontario pre-budget ask. So actually on, in Ontario, the Ontario government was one of, one of the first uh, provinces to start funding student nutrition programs. And so we've been doing so for many years, um, but we do need an increase to our core investment. Um, we And so we are asking, our Ontario chapter is asking the Ontario government to double its current investment. We currently have 32.2 million uh, put into of the First Nation and uh, student and the, and the Ontario Student Nutrition Program, we 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 need that to at least go to sixty four point four million, so programs can be stabilized, expanded, and enhanced. Um, we've also asked for twenty million dollars uh, in infrastructure over three years. So those are our pre-budget asks. And I, I wanted to let you know that, you know, we have been seeing these really great advancements in terms of investments from provinces and territories over the last couple of years, and really a lot over just the past couple of months. Um, so there's actually been so many uh, announcements that this slide, the text on this slide keeps on getting smaller and smaller. And so apologies if you can't see it really well, but it's also really exciting that this is happening. Um, the most recent one was in Quebec. Uh, so they just announced uh, 34 million over five years. So that increases their annual budget. Uh, it, it adds 6.8 million to their annual budget, which brings their annual budget up to just under 69 million a year, which is, is pretty big. Um, other really exciting announcements include Manitoba. So they, in uh, just a couple months ago, they announced uh, $30 million to create a universal program in the province. Um, it, just a couple weeks ago, Nova Scotia announced $18.8 .8 million to roll out a lunch program in the province. The Newfoundland uh, added $3 million to uh, expand their lunch program as well. And then in, uh, in uh, Alberta, there was an extra $5 million as a one-time investment put into their student nutrition programs there. Um, that's in addition to a, an increase that already happened last year. So lots of great investments across the board, and we're really excited that, that this is happening. Um, and we've, as, as you see, we have been collecting all this data on how much provinces and territories and municipalities currently invest in school food. And we, we, this helps us make the case that Canada needs to match what is already going on. Um, and as of next year, what we found, it, uh, as of the next school year, there's going to be eight, 284 million put in combined from provinces, territories, and municipalities um, on an annual basis. And so we've been telling the federal government that these programs exist, they're already being funded, the 200 million that you've uh, promised is going to be put to good, to good use and go to kids who need it. So we're ready for implementation. Oh, I think I skipped this guy. Oh. And yeah, there's also been some really great progress on showing decision makers that investing in school food is not only a good social policy, it's a really good economic policy as well. And so this new report has been really helpful with it, uh, this. It's by, by Dr. Amberly Rutz and her colleagues on the economic rationale for investing in school meal programs in Canada. Um, it shows a wide variety of impacts that investing in school meals from have can have. So things like providing relief to household budgets, um, improving lifetime earnings of students who participated in programs due to the increased learning outcomes that come out of them, um, creating jobs and strengthening, strengthening lo local food systems, and taking pressure off working parents. And even in one case, in one study, it showed that the, uh, mothers' workforce participation increased by 5%. So there's lots of really great information in this report. I encourage you to take a look and, and use it in your arguments as you uh, as you advocate for school food. Um, one, one piece is that the return on investment uh, that they found in this um, in this report is for every dollar put in, there's two and a half to seven times that that comes out of it in terms of ec the economic and health benefits that they provide. So they're re a really great investment, and we've been making that as part of our argument uh, to support uh, school food programs. Um, we also wanted to share that this year's Great Big Crunch was a huge success. We had over 220,000 participants take part so far. Um, this is our annual event that uh, celebrates school food where hundreds and thousands of teachers and schools and students and workplaces and decision makers participate uh, and take a crunch, uh, a, a bite out of a country food to raise awareness for school food and the, and the need for these programs to be supported. Um, Minister Studs at the federal level participated in, a, in our crunch on March 7th and said some words before we all crunch together. And then in Ontario, actually, the first was the first time that decision makers here in Ontario, Minister Parson participated by making a video for this year's crunch, which we were very pleased to see. Um, and yeah, crunches are still taking place. If you haven't crunched yet and you want to, we have a few more days left. Uh, so please do so if you'd like to.
Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to wrap up by talking about where we are, both federally and, and in Ontario. So uh, federally, um, we have we and our members have been having all, a lot of meetings with MPs uh, and political staff from across party lines, as well as officials in, in the Ministry of uh, Finance and the, and the main other ministries involved. And what we hear is thanks to the work of so many of our members and other champions from across the country, um, MPs are now really supportive of school food and they want to see it funded in Budget 2020. 24, and they're communicating this loudly, both within their caucuses and to the Minister of Finance, which we're thrilled about. It's really important. Um, we also we met with Minister Suds uh, last uh, a few weeks ago, and she is said that she was making the pitch as well, and that she's cautiously optimistic that funds will be in budget 2024. Though the the problem remains that budget the budget is tight, and so we will we are waiting to see. Um, but we have been doing lots of media uh, lately to really get this in the forefront of everybody's mind. Um, Carolyn Webb, our knowledge coordinator, uh, mobilization coordinator, was uh, at a press press con conference earlier this week with MPs where we talked about, you know, the, the need for the national program. Uh, Debbie Field and Amberly Rutz did 30 CBC morning shows a couple of weeks ago. And we know our members and endorsers have been doing a ton of media as well. So it's been really great to see school food being talked about, talked about more and more. Um, we also, uh, as some of you probably know, the NDP came out in support of school food earlier in March, which were, was really exciting. They did a press conference and called on the federal government to fulfill their commitment and roll out, a federal, uh, roll out funds in budget 2024. Um, and then we've also had really great support from provincial and educational, uh, provincial and national educational organizations. So um, the Ontario Public School Boards Associations have has been helping with meetings as well as template letters that they've sent out across uh, Ontario to get boards to to write to the federal government to say they want to see this. Um, and then the T Canadian Teachers Federation just launched a letter writing campaign across across Canada that is asking educators and everybody in that sector to write letters to uh, the Prime Minister and Minister Freeland. So that's really great to see. Um, and yeah, in, in some we're, we're all eagerly awaiting the federal budget announcement. It's uh, on April 16th is when we're going to hear whether, you know, the years of adv advocacy that so many, ev that everybody has been doing for so many years and see if this comes to fruition. And we have an announcement uh, for a national program. Um, we're crossing our fingers. Nothing is guaranteed, but yeah, we are hopeful. Um, we also, uh, I also want to note if anybody's uh, interested in getting involved in this kind of final push and writing a letter, we do have a template on our website that you can, that you can use to do so. Um, and then in Ontario, I will let you know that, uh, so in Ontario, uh, we have seen, uh, some movement and in 2023, there was 6.15 million put in as a one-time investment from our government, um, to, uh, to, to the programs. Uh, we, we did appreciate this one-time investment, but we do know that a significant uh, increase to the core program is needed for programs to be sustainable in the long term. Um, and we have been actually doing quite a bit of media to cover the current situation and some of the challenges that student nutrition program providers have been facing, uh, which has allowed us to explain why we're asking for Ontario to double its investment and the impact that that's going to have on programs and students, of course. Um, and so today is actually budget day in Ontario, so we're eagerly awaiting this budget as well to see if there's any more funding announced. Um, and, you know, if we don't see a large increase like we're asking for, we will be working really hard towards budget 2025 by building awareness and support among MPPs and political staff, as well as broad public awareness of the benefits and impacts that these programs have. So um, if you're not part of the coalition yet, but you'd like to be, we would love to have you join us and I will send out this link to uh, to be part of our network if, if you'd like to be. So with that, I'm going to stop there and we're going to uh, turn it over to our pre presenters. Um, we're going to start with Ula uh, Knowles, who was a former uh, student uh, nutrition program manager at Foodshare Toronto, and um, she's going to tell us all about the City of Toronto's funding um, history. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Sarah, and thanks for the exciting updates from across the country. Um, as much as we're uh, kind of working in our own separate areas, it's always nice to hear the broader picture and know we're not alone. A very key message there. Um, so if I can ask for the next slide, please, or first slide. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to go through this in great detail. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick snap uh, shot of uh, where we're at and where we began. So in 1991, we started with $180,000 of funding in um, the city of Toronto. 
With and our current budget, which was just approved for student nutrition for 2024, is 19 million plus. Um, the initial uh, number of students served was approximately 4,000. We currently sit at over 211,000 students. If I could um, have the next slide, please. Okay, so just quickly, in 1992, a $180,000 pilot project uh, was initiated uh, by the City of Toronto, and not the City of Toronto, but Metro Toronto before amalgamation, um, and the Toronto District School Board to um, address uh, eight of our neediest schools. Uh, it was for K to eight, and all children were allowed to participate, and there were pro approximately 44,000, sorry, 4,000 uh, participants. When they get to got to the end of the um, the pilot, um, they were unsure on how to proceed, and and they asked the community um, how how they would like to proceed. They didn't know how to fund this uh, until one of the participants or parents of the participants said, "Please don't um, leave parents out of the funding equation." Um, they felt even if that they couldn't pay or pay very much, they wanted to be able to participate. They valued the program that much. These are key things to remember. Um, in 1993, uh, we had the first dedicated um, municipal funding by a grant application process, um, and it was a yearly thing. Um, a key date I wanted to point out as well was in 1995. It was the first um, uh, provincial funding that we saw. Um, uh, Sarah, you had alluded to this, and it was $500,000 for K to 13, grade 13 schools. And it was a grant application to Breakfast for Learning. Um, in 2004, I find this one really important municipally uh, because it was the first time in the city of Toronto that secondary programs were considered for funding. Next slide, please. Thank you. So from 2008 to 2015, all of you that are from Ontario, you're well aware, there was a huge influx of provincial funding to student nutrition programs, specifically for breakfast and morning meals in designated sites. Um, at the same time, municipal funding uh, from 2009 to 2012 saw just modest increases. Uh, in 2013, we saw the, uh, the first big significant increase in municipal funding base of about 1.5 million was added to the pot. Um, 28, uh, by 2018, municipal funding uh, was back to 20%. Um, I just wanna go back to 2013 and let you know that some of our critical and initial historically funded programs, the funding base had gone down to about 8% and the programs that were most needed were actually failing and um, actually closing. So there was a lot of work to get the city to go back up to that uh, approximate 20%. Uh, funding cost. Um, in 2019, something that's especially uh, important to myself is uh, the it was the first municipal funding consideration given for student nutrition programs in independent schools. These are non-publicly funded schools assessed by the same criteria to determine that if they would be eligible for funding, and they were. Uh, in 2024, our current SMP budget um, sits at 19 million plus. That's an increase of 1.5 million or 8.5% uh, over 2023. And that addresses the inflationary cost of food. Next slide, please. Um, so how did we get there? I can't talk about um, the period of 1992 to uh, 2000 because I, I really wasn't involved on a greater scale other than writing to my local authorities or talking to them and saying, hey, we need more money. So, and you know, these are the kids in my school, which was an inner city school and, and we need help. Um, but once I became a community development or a community rep, um, we started a regular program here in the city of uh, Toronto. The first one was just in 2001 where there were letters to the mayor and the city councillors, um, where we gave them, you know, the general city stats and then the stats for their awards. Um, so, sorry, I'm losing my paperwork. Um, then um, 
from 2002 onwards, uh, the letters uh, went to each counselor and the mayor with an actual list of schools and the stats for their awards. It was also the first time we created, created a large physical map of student nutrition program uh, locations across the city, um, which we actually had at various um, functions um, within, the, um, within the city, uh, and it actually resided in the mayor's office for a few months, um, created quite a bit of buzz and it was a point of conversation. Um, in 2010 through to 2020, uh, we created counselor packages and um, these were a much more uh, detailed package that included um, individual ward maps and then overall city stats, a board of health, a student nutrition program uh, budget ask and the rationale behind that. And uh, also an SNP impact sheet. And I was the one that was um, privileged enough to be consulted uh, with um, by Toronto Public Health. And we worked in partnership together to develop these packages. I also hand delivered the, uh, these packages in person to every city councillor um, just prior to the annual budget process. So that would have been in January. Um, so, sorry, yes, that's correct, thank you. <laughs> so I just wanna make a point here. Every point of contact counts. Every single one counts. Whether it's letters, phone calls, or emails, each contact, remember, each contact from a resident in the ward is recorded. So that equals a vote potentially in the next election. So it's an important whoever you're sending this to. Hand address, I know it sounds old fashioned, but hand address the envelope. Don't do mailing labels. Use actual postage stamps. They draw attention. It's a personal thing. Uh, don't try, try really hard to not do a mass mail out. Um, you can, however, provide a template and encourage people, though, to in, uh, share their personal impacts. Ask them to be authentic. Um, student artwork, thank you notes uh, to create awareness. Um, we've done that uh, throughout and even before my time. Um, counselors loved showing the artwork on their walls. And in fact, I used to see them, you know, years after successive years of visiting uh, with the next package and they go here, look, there's my, uh, there's the stuff from last year or two years ago, or three years ago. I support this. It resonates with them. Key important things to try and do is try, try very hard and be persistent to get a visit to a counselor or a mayor's office. Some of the best times are right after um, an election and someone new is there. Um, they wanna get to know you, they wanna listen to everybody, they wanna show you know, that they are listening. So be prepared with information about an overview um, with program statistics and current funding amounts and sources. One minute, thanks. <laughs> and um, be clear on what you're asking for and why it should be important to them. Um, you're asking them to partner with other levels of government and other funders in the private sector to deliver a viable program. It's a partnership. They're not asking them to fund the entire thing. They aren't aligned or not yet on board. Find some commonality between them and yourself and make it about them and the future that they envision. Always include end user stories from the programs um, in their own uh, board. So the deputations at, um, at a budget committee or of a town council meeting, board of health meeting, or community and social services, whatever um, um, opportunity you have within your own city or town, do this with a combination of your student nutrition program uh, partners. Um, it's important they have the information on the research and the stats. Demonstrate what current funding pays for and what it should like if it were fully funded. Focus on deputations, though, by the program coordinators or the end users, the students uh, of the programs. Ask them to share their personal experiences from the programs. Tell them to be honest, share their successes and challenges. Um, next, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Oh, I'm on my final thoughts and reflections. Try to get them to visit a program and, and just you know, be honest, show them realistically 
the challenges you are having and what it would look like if they had funding from you or more funding from you. Um, so final thoughts and reflections. Work with your supporters. Seek those that are not already on board. Be prepared to work with people of all political stripes and keep your own private. Find common ground, make it personal, even uh, if they're not on board. Overall statistics demonstrate the need. Individual stories bring those statistics to life. They make it real, they pull in your audience and appeal to their humanity. Exercise patience, but keep the pressure up. All good things take time. Um, in 1991, I'll remind you, it was 180,000, 4,000 students. In 2024, it is 19 plus million, 211,000 plus students. You want the funding to be permanent and not a temporary fix. Remind them that they are not being expected to fund at all. There are partners and everyone has a part to play. It's a communal effort and it stops them from trying to pass the buck onto someone else. Over a 33 year period, the SMP budget in the city of Toronto has consistently increased, remained at the same, level only once and reduced by 4% only once. And that was early on years. Thanks. Thank you. That was so great. Yeah, so much great information shared. I did quickly, I, I skipped one of your slides, but I'm going to ask you that question when in the question and answer period. So you can talk to us about the... Um, yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you so much. And we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna now pass it on to Chris, um, who is the, uh, Chris Peacock is the executive director at The Sharing Place in Aurelia. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you can go ahead and share yours. Thank you very much. Wonderful presentation, Ula. That was, that was great to see that history. Um, okay, I'm just going to share. Why isn't it working? There we go. Do you see the presenter view or the full screen here? Well, uh, we see the presenter view. Okay, let me just think. Yeah. Sorry. Now, do you see the full screen? Yes. Awesome. All right, Sharing Place Food Center. Um, we uh, So I put together just kind of a, a long-term sustainable fundraising presentation here just to understand how we operate as an organization with our, our fundraising. Um, our core program, so we have four core programs at our organization. We have School Fuel, uh, which a lot of the individuals here would resonate with. Uh, we have an online e-commerce platform. That platform allows 23 local schools to purchase food at 50% off. So we fund 50% the schools fund the other 50%. We deliver every two weeks. So they build up an inventory of food every two weeks, and then we replenish it, open our store, they buy more, uh, and it just uh, goes throughout the school year. We have a food bank. That's our largest program, seven-day supply of food. It's a dignified, welcoming space. People come in, access food. We try to keep it as healthy as possible. Uh, and, uh, and we also do deliveries for that program as well. Food recovery, we have a food recovery program, drives around town, picking up surplus food at local grocery stores, farmers, food producers, and recovering that, bringing it into our facility, fueling our programs themselves. School fuel is 100% purchased. We don't use recovered food for that program, but all our other programs leverage the capacity that's brought into that food recovery program. And then Meals for Change is a cooking program where we cook over 2,000 meals a week. We freeze them, distribute them through our food bank and through other um, uh, partners as well throughout the community and surrounding region. We help out up in Gravenhurst and, and the Aurelia area. So those are our four core programs. The numbers at our organization, we have an annual operating budget of 1.4 million. We have nine staff members and 163 volunteers. That 1.4 million is, we don't get government funding. We get some grants from the government, but it's an annual thing. We have to essentially just go and hunt for funding. Uh, so we're we're hustling all the time to ensure that uh, we can sustain the the operating budget of 1.4 million, which means we have to really have our our game on. So this is our eight step long term sustainable fundraising strategy, which I put together last week. Uh, um, step one, and it's a really important one, is to be super passionate about your vision, mission, values of your organization. Communicate it clearly. Have everyone on the same page. And 
I know this is about fundraising, but that's paramount to be able to be able to communicate to your funders, to your donors, to community, to your volunteers, to all your different individuals that connect to your organization. So having everyone on that same page and be able to carry that same message is essential to be able to have your clear communication out in your community. And the other thing is just having an organizational plan for the future. People love to know what you're doing next, where you're going, where you're heading. And if you're super organized with that direction, uh, people can get on board and want to participate in that vision. So really important to have those core pillars for any successful organization, but more importantly, for a successful, successful fundraising plan is to be well organized on that front and communicate very well. Um, number two for us is clearly defining your programs, your outcomes, and your goals. Um, Ula mentioned the outcomes and being able to track those statistics and be able to communicate them effectively to the municipality, uh, but it also is important to be able to communicate it to your funders and to your community, to your volunteers, and so on. So having a clear description of your program, having a clear description of your outcomes, which means you have to track and have to measure the data of all the work that you're doing within your organization. For us, School Fuel, over 4,000 kids a day are being fed through our program, supporting 23 schools. Uh, and we have other outcomes with regards, with regards to nutritional outputs and stuff like that, uh, that we're able to fuel our, our schools with. And then having those goals, where are we going? Where are we heading for each individual program? We have a nice impact report on our, um, on our website that will be able to highlight this. Uh, and it highlights every one of our programs and the goals that we're trying to achieve to make sure we can get people on board. Step number three is uh, building that communication and fundraising capacity. So being able to have a, like these are pretty rudimentary or, or simple, but they're essential is that website, being able to be able to found, on, found online, being able to have a donation portal on your website. Ideally, if you're of a certain scale, you can have a donor management software to be able to receipt, communicate and learn about your donor pool. Having an e-newsletter, we at times for us, we feel like a lot of people know about what we're doing, but they don't at times as well. So it's important for us to communicate with our community with regards to the, the work we're doing. So we do a quarterly newsletter, printed materials and social media. Again, leave behinds and ways to connect with your community is essential uh, to be able to build that awareness and build that community of support. Media is something we do all the time. We're, we're reaching out to CTV, to our local paper or digital copy of the paper. Uh, to just communicate. They're looking for stories. Like it's not too hard to get into the news if you communicate with them, make relationships with your local media to be able to share the stories of the programs you're running and the initiatives you're doing. They're, they're usually happy to share that with the community. Grant writing is a huge part of our, our revenue stream as well, is making sure that you're identifying different grants that exists out in the community and being able to write outcomes, tracking and measuring what you do is essential to be able to write grants because uh, that's what funders would want to know is how their money has improved your services and your community. So being able to track those outcomes is huge. And then probably one of the most important parts is having an incredible team. It, having a team, if it's volunteer-based or if it's staff, um, we lean heavily on our volunteers and we lean heavily on our staff. But being able to create that incredible team, as well as a fundraising team that can get out into the community and do more experiential work out in the community to build awareness is huge but the team is, is paramount. To anything we're doing, we try really hard to nurture and create a really positive team. Uh, find great partners. Collective impact is a huge thing for us, working with others uh, across all areas and, and fundraising is a core part of that. Third party events, we lean heavily on uh, incredible organizations in our community that raise money for us. It's very soft touch on our end, not a lot of effort and work, uh, and, and they essentially raise the funds for us. Food banks in general benefit from third-party fundraisings outside of other organizations. Um, but we've been able to develop and continue to communicate with those third parties. Tim Horton's Smile Campaign is one that we just ran last year. It didn't run. We benefited from because of the third-party event that was going on. Uh, and we got out into uh, the community and supporting Tim Horton's Smile Campaign. School fundraisers are a big part. We're about to launch our School Fuel Month in April to work with our 23 schools to collect funds for our program. Sport clubs, we just did a really minor hockey association, just did a big fundraiser for us throughout the, uh, the month of March to be able to raise funds for our organization. Service clubs, we're always talking to Rotary Club, Kiwanis Club, different, uh, different clubs throughout our community. I go and talk to those clubs to build awareness. 
grocery stores are a huge uh, donor of ours to our food recovery program, but we can get in front of grocery stores and, and hand out top needed items and be able to promote the different services that we, or the programs that we deliver. Local agency, so leaning on other agencies. So finding great partners isn't just for a fundraising, but is also to be able to provide service. We benefit from multiple programs, so we can help out other agencies through our food bank program and through our food recovery program. And showing that collective impact is huge because the community will want to support organizations that kind of reach out across the entire community and connect to those agencies where we're not just supporting the sharing place, we're supporting the Lighthouse, Coochie Jubilee House, the different agencies throughout our community, Salvation Army, St. Vincent de Paul, and knowing that we help raise all organizations allows individuals to know that they can support ours and they can collectively impact the whole community. So a big deal there. And then advocacy teams, like the Coalition of Healthy School Food is a huge, incredible, like just Sarah, like well done. Like seeing that pre presentation on all the impact that they're making, if an organization like us connects to the Coalition of Healthy School Food, Beat Ontario, Simcoe County Food Council, like all these different agencies, if you're shown as a leader in the area that you're advocating for the bigger picture, um, people see that and resonate that resonates with community and they want to support organizations that get the bigger picture. So that's a, a really important. Setting a budget and making a plan is step five. Um, a huge part of any successful organization is just being organized. And so we have a fundraising budget, a development budget, and we have a monthly plan. Every month we have different things we execute on. We review it weekly. We take a look at it. We have a team of one, Kelly Allen is our development manager. And the two of us sit down and then we, we get, some support from volunteers and other staff members to make sure we're just staying on track and ensuring that we're able to execute our, our plan. And then we obviously have a budget on how much it's gonna cost us uh, and we work with what we have. Um, and then step number seven is a big one, is just that measurement of everything you do, if you have the capacity to. I know the smaller the organization, the harder it is to get all organized and, and measure everything, but it's a huge part of us. You wanna measure, you want to learn from that measurement. You want to adapt and then innovate. We're always coming up with something new to do here at the sharing place, whatever it might be. Um, and, and making sure that, that gets awareness. The more you innovate, the more you change, the adapt. That's a new story you can promote to the media and, and share that, that, that story of innovation and that story of kind of continuing to increase your outcome. And then finally, be kind. We're a dignified, incredible organization that we really train our volunteers and staff members to be dignified, welcoming, and be kind to our community or of our members. Build an incredible team is essential to be able to, uh, to do what you do. Run great programs. That's been, we do a really great job of running great programs, and I feel the money follows. The more you do great work, the more kind you are, the money will follow your organization. And, and the only way that that to be told is if you're sharing your progress and efforts with the team. And that's essentially true. And I think that's it. I think I got under eight minutes, Sarah. A little bit over, but that's okay. Ah. Thank, you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. That was all so great. So many great uh, ideas for everybody to take. And the, just your whole grant strategy. I know you only, uh, uh, or fundraising strategy, you only put it together last week, but it looks like it's, you've been working on it for a long time. So really appreciate you sharing everything. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly now, and uh, Kelly and Jen from the Hastings Prince Edward County Learning Foundation. So um, yeah, I'll let you take it over. Oh, can you see my screen? Yes. All right, so good morning, everyone. I'm Kelly Brace. I'm the operations manager for the Hastings and Prince Edward Learning Foundation. And we are the charity attached to the Hastings and Prince Edward District School Board. And um, also in that capacity, we're the lead agency for Southeastern Ontario for student nutrition programs and work with three community partnership committees, the Food Sharing Project in Kingston, Food for Thought in Lanark and Food for Learning here in Hastings and Prince Edward counties. And unfortunately, unlike Toronto, without the $19 million in municipal funding, we still have to do a lot of on the ground local fundraising to be able to, to meet the financial demands of our student nutrition programs. And the local community partnership Food for Learning, which is housed here in our foundation, 
um, initiated a project, oh gosh, I think 13 or 14 years ago called Feed the Meter. So we're gonna talk, um, Jen and I are gonna talk about two different specific fundraising initiatives that we've done um, to help student nutrition programs right in the community. One that's been successful and one that we're anticipating is gonna be very successful uh, in the future. So Feed the Meter, over here, let's see if we can get my slideshow going. Feed the Meter started um, as a partnership with the Downtown Business Improvement Association. So we heard um, for a few years, we'd been, we would hear that through the month of December, downtown parking would be free um, as an initiative of a DBIA. So we thought, why not partner with them and see if instead of it being free, we could ask the community to make donations during that free parking time and have all the, the, those donations come to the student nutrition program. So we have three communities in this area, uh, Picton, Trenton and Belleville that still had paid parking on the streets with parking meter poles. And we did a deputation to those three municipalities, not asking them for money, but asking for the use of their parking meters to collect donations. And that's how it started. It started very small, simply with putting a sign on the poles and uh, asking the community to just give their spare change. And boy, was it an example of how every little bit helps. Um, the municipalities collected the change and at the end of December forwarded it to us and um, it, it grew thousands of dollars um, and became one of the core fundraising initiatives of Food for Learning. And it, um, it provided us an opportunity to, to connect with the community in a new way. Those that felt like they didn't have the thousands of dollars could still put a loony in and still be a contributor. And we really leaned on that message. Um, so much so that when Jen joined our team last summer, she took Feed the Meter and said, we're gonna do something fun and different. So we've expanded Feed the Meter um, to not just be collecting money at the meters. Um, we have leveraged Giving Tuesday as the sort of launch launching pad for this campaign and we did road tolls in those communities this year, um, voluntary collection right on the streets as people went to work in the morning on Giving Tuesday. We've done community breakfasts in the past with all the food being donated and our guests had a donation envelope on the table asking them to contribute to Feed the Meter. And all of these little bits um, contributed to a really successful campaign this year that raised over $50,000. So it's it grows and grows and grows. And I think Jen has some great ideas going into the future, um, but it just to show that when we go into the community and, and ask for the quarters and the loonies and toonies, when you add it all together, it becomes $50,000. And certainly something that we lean on and, um, and helps us to have such sustainable funding in the fall. Another really big, um, revenue stream for the Feed the Meter campaign are the sponsors. So because there are signs all through the downtown areas, whether it's in the windows, oh, here's some pictures, thank you. <laughs> um, you'll see some parking meter poles at the bottom of the sign are the sponsors of the campaign. So it's a really good way to promote those sponsors multiple times over. Their logo is on every parking meter throughout downtown. It's very palatable for them because of that repetition. Here are some of the promotional pieces over the years. On the far left is the most current. Um, and we, we change it up every year to look a little bit different and um, keep that, that interest and also connect it to the, the holidays. And here's our road tolls, some of our road tolls um, at our community breakfast. And um, we heard about student art and student thank yous and we always have um, thank you cards done by students that we give out to our supporters of, of Feed the Meter. Um, that is something certainly that works really well and, and, uh, and we'll continue to do. And in the essence of time, I don't wanna to spend too much time because Jen's gonna talk about a really exciting initiative that we have that I think everyone will be excited about. Yeah, so good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, so my name is Jen Barrett. I am new to the Learning Foundation and the Student Nutrition. Um, 
but old, as you will say, to fundraising uh, and have worked for national, provincial, and community organizations my entire year fundraising. Um, so when it, before I started with the Learning Foundation in the summer, we had a staff meeting, um, some kind of planning sessions. And uh, one of my things was, was, okay, tell me your wish list. What do you hope to achieve in terms of fundraising? You know, what do you want to get to? Uh, one of the staff members said, I would love to see a regional fundraising initiative for the student nutrition programs. Uh, she did have the concept, had seen some Chase the Ace uh, events that were happening um, kind of organically in some of the smaller communities and really wanted to see that come to fruition. Uh, so I took that away and said, OK, how do we make this, you know, a 2023 at that point version? Um, and how do we really turn that into a very profitable fundraising campaign? Um, my first thing when I thought of that is we are not going old school um, in terms of, you know, service clubs sitting out and selling tickets at grocery stores and all those kinds of things. Uh, I knew if we wanted to do something, it definitely needed to be an electronic version of a raffle campaign. Um, and Sorry, Kelly's just doing some turning. Um, I needed, we needed an electronic version of a campaign. So different when you run um, any gaming operation, if you're doing an in-person version, you apply to your local municipality for your licensing. When you move to an online strategy, you actually apply to the AGCO and it's more of a provincial thing. The vendors, when you work with the AGCO for your licensing, they have approved vendors that can do online gaming. So they've already done all the vetting of these online vendors that can do actual legal legitimate license or gaming in our province. So when I started doing research on these, there is two big companies that have approval through AGCO to do Chase the Ace concepts. I reached out to those vendors um, and quickly got told they don't deal with any charities unless you already have a previous background of doing raffles, starting at a minimum revenue of $75,000. As we're starting fresh- One minute. One minute, oh my goodness. Um, we, we went with a 50-50 concept. Uh, we are working with Rafflebox. We have currently submitted to, um, it's a multiple step application process. So we've submitted the first two steps. We're waiting on our approval for the licensing. Um, so with the 50-50 raffle that's going to come out from us, we are excited. It'll be our first regional fundraiser. Um, so again, Hastings Prince Edward, Kingston and Lanark have all joined together to build that force in this 50-50 fundraiser. Um, because it is online, it's very, um, the work that needs to be done is marketing based, right? So doing your radio, your billboards, your commercials, um, the sky is the limit in ways that we will be able to market and get ticket sales up for this program. Um, we are excited because it is the first regional um, fundraiser that we've done. The other thing is this concept does lend to being able to solicit sponsors. Uh, we already have a title sponsor that we attend or intend to solicit because it is a big, larger regional partner, which would lend very well to this. Um, the other good thing with doing online lotteries and things like that, it really captures your um, purchaser's information. So you have access to who did the purchasing, their email contact information, all those good things. Um, I can't even pretend that you are going to be able to down the road convert all of those people into donors. Um, but it really allows you then to have this huge audience to start to tell them about your program. So as Chris said, you know, telling your story and, and really getting out what programs and what impact your food for learn or your student nutrition programs are having. Then Kelly, I'm going to flip to the last slide. <laughs> um, what the other benefit of this program is 
for future and down the road. We're starting with three partners, but it has the capacity and lends to an amazing opportunity if we and other partners out there choose to then join in to this 50-50 raffle. Um, we have a great kind of role model to look up to, if you will. Nova Scotia firefighters actually run a 50-50 raffle um, through Rafflebox, the same company we're working with. Their raffle, they do it weekly, and all the little firehouses through all of Nova Scotia join in partner to do this together. Their weekly raffle is around $190,000 to $250,000 every single week for all their little firefight, like all the little firehouses to share and divvy. I think the, the, the amazing point to this, every single student nutrition program could go out and run their own 50-50. But the power of working together lends for so much more opportunity down the road if we really partner and work together. Um, so we're hoping kind of future that that is something um, that other organizations consider kind of joining and, and really building that. So and that's it. Making nope. it a provincial. Making it provincial. Fire. That's right. We would love to see that. <laughs> Um, but we are waiting on the raffle license green light. Um, and as soon as we have that, we'll start. And it's just going to be one of those things that builds. It just keeps building and building. So we're excited. That's so exciting. Thank you, Jen and Kelly. That's so, such great campaigns that you're running. And yeah, the, the opportunities for expansion are huge, as you say. And, you know, the, the I love the all the sponsorship opportunities integrated into all your campaigns. Yeah, really good stuff. Um, it's been so great to hear from all three of you. Uh, what a wealth of uh, in, information and ideas that you shared. I really appreciate you all um, being here and presenting uh, at this talk today. Um, I'm gonna we we have a, we have about ten minutes left, and so I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, the audience to see if there's any questions um, that people have for anybody. You can just raise your hand, by the way, or you can uh, put your questions in the chat and I'll read them out. Kelly, um, will, uh, Kelly and Jen, will that 50-50, will that be taking place, do you think, before June? So our hope, uh, the raffle licensing, again, it's a two-part licensing. Um, it's already been submitted for weeks now. My hope is that it is in with the idea of coming to the end of April as a, a first launch. Um, and if not, the end of May being the first, you know, winning, winning day. So we would be advertising and selling tickets all of May with the draw. So we have chosen to do the draw the last Wednesday of every month um, as the starter winning Wednesdays, if you yeah. will. Yeah. Um, our hope is to have it May, June. Obviously, it was is every month. So we would still be doing it throughout the summer as well. And then really just going all in for the fall, but having it started this year. Great. Keep sharing everything because this this would be so doable. Thank you for doing all that legwork. We have. We're, we didn't share it, but there will be a point in time. We already have a brand created and a name and, and all those good pieces we're working on as we're waiting for the lottery license. Um, so, Is it on stereo or just for you guys? Just for us for now. Let us get, let us launch it and uh, practice it a little bit and then we'll offer it out to the other lead agencies. But the really, um, fun thing about this is that the, the ticket buyer can assign the revenue from their ticket to their community. So oh, it's a drop down of all the different. So when we launch it, right. our three community partnerships in this area will be listed and the donor can choose one or area of greatest need um, as a fourth option. But if they live in Smith's Falls, they can choose food for thought as the recipient of their half Right. Their tickets. So as this builds, as you if you go on to the firefighters um, raffle that Jen was talking about, you'll see all the lists of all the communities that the donor can pick where they want their portion of the 50-50 to go to. Okay, that's fabulous. Very exciting. First time we've had excitement like this in a while. Contain yourself, Darlene. <laughs> 
Um, I we have a question in the chat. I'm curious if anyone in, uh, of, the, of the presenters can speak to transitioning funding sources from pri private to public for projects. Perhaps if anyone can speak more to privately funding a pilot to get momentum slash proof of concept and then receiving provincial or municipal funding, how has this happened? And how this has happened? Does anybody have thoughts on that? Chris? I, I could speak to that. It, so ideally starting something privately is a good idea because it can provide proof of concept. You have a team, they're working well, they're executing the program and the municipalities don't wanna take on a lot of risks. So anything new, or a province or a fed. So anything new would be of concern to them. But then if you can prove that this is a successful model, you're tracking all your outcomes, you'll be able to deliver, you've got a team that's working well, then you can start doing your deputations and, and speaking to counselors and, and, and trying to get the temperature of the situation, find some counselors that support your initiative, get their advice on how to pitch it to council and to do your deputation. Uh, it's, you kind of have to do your own little lobbying work and, and, and talk to each counselor if you have the capacity to do so. And then once you get there, you can do your deputation. And essentially, you're, you're just asking for money from their budget or get them to like be able to fund your program. So it's just up to them. But if you do all the work beforehand, then they'll start to fund it uh, municipally. Provincially, it's a little more challenging. But municipally, that would be the direction. And it, it's possible, definitely, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Thanks, Chris. And... If there's no other hands, I wanted to bring us back to Ula's presentation. You had some great points about uh, when you're bringing uh, counselors or any decision makers to a school visit, um, what are kind of the important points to to remember in those visits? How, how... Sure, thanks uh, very much for that, uh, Sarah. Yes, um, I think the site visits are, are crucial and they're very critical. There's a few key points to remember when you're going to do this. Check with always check with your school board or site authority if that's not in a school. Be aware of the protocols and make sure you follow them to the letter. That's really uh, important because you want to be able to build not only rapport with um, who you're trying to entice for funding, you need to keep a good relationship with your partners and with the specific um, board or, or organization that you're working with. Um, showcase and this i find most important we all want to put our best foot forward uh, but i think i would strongly recommend you um, show the average student nutrition program not the perfect program so and 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 showcase what are the expectation expectations for delivery of that program um and and for the funding purposes so for your grant for instance uh, to receive a grant, you're supposed to run a program five days a week, food groups from three food, uh, full servings from three food groups um, to each child, at least to be able to offer that. When your reality is you're running two to three days a week, you're possibly going towards the end, you know, of your funding cycle. And um, you're only maybe serving one to two out of the three food groups and they're reduced portion sizes. This is your reality and leads you to laying the groundwork on why you're asking the funding, why you need something that's sustainable, uh, sustained and keeps the program running and delivering as what the children need. Um, also explain what are your greatest needs? Is it money for food? You might even venture that um, you need volunteers or you need equipment uh, or whatever else because you never know what's possible. I once went and we had a city councilor visiting a, a program and the program, actually the student said, oh, you really need a fridge. The counselor, and I have to explain, I won't mention who they were, far right leaning counselor, not on board with student nutrition programs at all, um, had a brand new fridge delivered to the school because the students asked for it. And the next day at budget, um, I got asked, Ula, what do you want? Uh, what else do you need? Because he was so enthralled with the program. And um, I said, well, what I need is we need another 108000 at budget tomorrow. That's what the Toronto Public Health ask is short. And he said, okay. And so we got to council the next day. I, I had no idea if he was going to do it or not. Uh, I told him to consult Board of Health. 
and um, and and because they had all all the information that he would need. And the next day he called me down because I was sitting at council because I stare at them. They have to remember who you are. It's not me, who you are, who's asking, put your face out there. Don't be afraid. It's, it's time well spent um, because they remember you and uh, whether they roll their eyes on next meeting, eventually, you know, your message will get through to them, be persistent. But uh, he came up and he asked um. So uh, what do you, you know, what exactly is it? And I said, well, I think you better talk to the, you know, the ones that are sitting on Toronto Public Health. And so, which were more right-leaning. And so I said, I said, I think you need to talk to them. So I called them over. I said, so this is, and they're going, what? And their people cross the floor and work together. That's what you got to go for. Um be honest when you have people visit. Please be honest. Don't ever show them the perfect program. They'll think you're okay. And treat the visit before they come to visit a program, treat it as a learning opportunity, not a photo op. I, whenever I've asked someone to come in to a program after okaying with everybody, one of the first things I said, please don't bring the cameras. There's the whole rigmarole of getting, you know, permission and all that. But that aside, most schools have that signed off for most students and can wrangle around the ones that don't have that. Don't make this a photo op for them. Make it clear because then if you, it's not a photo op. It's interesting when the camera isn't rolling and no one's recording. Questions and answers and comments flow most freely if that camera is absent. And then you see the real person and who you're dealing with and they see the real program most successful very successful thank you that's so yeah such great insights i love it and i'm sure everybody will be taking taking a lot of everybody's presentations away um we are two minutes past uh 12 so we have come to the end of our webinar um if anybody does have any extra questions we can we can stick around maybe for a minute or two but i don't see any hands um, I just could, want to say, could Ula just keep talking for the next hour and teaching us like <laughs> many wise things? <laughs> my email is available. You can contact me anytime. I'll give you my number as well uh, privately and uh, happy to chat and and help. I'm I'm and I just have to say I am thrilled to see what's happening. Um, um, you know, across this province and across this country. Kudos to the coalition uh, for all the great work uh, you're doing. I was there at its inception and uh, I was one of the founding members and so excited on the inroads you have made nationally, but so excited to see the new things that are happening in each region. Um, it, it really makes my heart sing um, that, um, so much fantastic work is being done. We're getting there. It takes time. It takes persistence. But oh my God, we're getting there. We're getting there. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. It's, and it's true. It does take time and persistence and all these people working together. So yeah, I really, we again, appreciate this today. And thank you so much for joining us, everybody who, who's on the call. And thanks so much for sharing everybody who, who presented. So yeah, we'll be sharing out the recording when, uh, and the, probably the question and answer period too, because it was great and there's no sense in not sharing everything. <laughs> so yeah, thanks again, everybody. If you want to stick around, we'll, we'll be here.